Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you, Rick, and thank you for the Parkinson's Network of Mount Diablo for inviting me to speak to you today. I'm going to uh, share my screen and jump right into the slides um, because there's a lot to talk about. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen well now. And yes. really, the, 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 the title is Curing with Sound Using Focus Ultrasound, and then it's really focused on what you can do for treatment of Parkinson's disease. So here is the, let's see, is it? All right, I'll have to manually advance it. Okay, here's the agenda. Really, I'm gonna talk a little bit about focused ultrasound because I know some people may know a lot about it, but others may not. So I want everybody to have a little basic understanding of it. And then a brief discussion of who the foundation is, just so you know what we are and what our agenda is and what it isn't. And also the bulk of the time will be on the research update, but I will have time at the end for questions. So focus ultrasound really is an early stage process. It's um, it's kind of like MRI was 40 years ago when it was a cool device, but nobody knew about it. And it took a long time for it to be uh, readily available. But now virtually everybody has somebody or has known somebody who's had an MRI. Well, focus ultrasound is kind of in the same stage, just a little bit later down the pike, because it's still unknown. P people refer to it as medicine's best kept secret, and it has the potential, and I emphasize the word potential, to really revolutionize therapy. And the, the way it works is just like a magnifying glass going after a, 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 a leaf. Let me see if I can highlight this here, because there we go. Um, it The idea is we're concentrating the focus ultrasound um, uh, beams of, 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 of energy on a remote target. Just like in, in the magnifying glass, we just rotate it around and this is aiming at a target inside this patient's breast. And the, the ultrasound energy can pass through the body really without causing any problems to the, um, to the patient along the way until it gets to the target point. And at the point of convergence, all of the energy is at that same spot and it can heat the, the tissue and basically burn it. And that, that way you can have a, a treatment inside the body, even though the focus ultrasound is, is, is contained outside the body. Um, and the way this is really done is this is done as an outpatient. It's, it's, it's done with really um, no incisions, uh, there's less pain, and all of the things that you would have when you do invasive surgery or procedures, you can really avoid because you don't have to worry about healing or hemorrhage or any of those types of things. Another really cool part of this is it's very good at adjacent tissue sparing. So if you look over here on the left-hand side of this liver page, this tissue is all basically just... Um, uh, treated and as just a mess of, 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 of treatment debris, where right to the right is normal cells. And this is amplified. This is only a one millimeter um, uh, uh, amplification here. So there's a very good line between what's treated and what's not. And the same type of thing is on the right-hand screen, which is a picture of treatment in the brain. There are many focus ultrasound devices but this one right here is the Insight Tech device, and that's the one that's been FDA approved and is used for treating people in the US now. There are a number of factors that can go into how you treat someone with focused ultrasound. And one of those is the level of energy. For most of the treatment that we'll be talking about, we're talking about high intensity focused ultrasound or sometimes called HIFU. And really that's what you do to create lesions inside the body. But there's also the medium intensity or sometimes called pulsed ultrasound. And that can really be used for opening of the blood brain barrier. And we will talk about that a little bit. And just for completeness, there's also the low intensity neuromodulation where you can actually use focus ultrasound to either make the tissue more likely to be excited or less likely to be excited, depending on how you use it, um, in terms of modification of, of the impact on, on the condition. Sorry, this is a busy slide because there's a number of different biomechanisms that you can use focus ultrasound to do. And I really, I don't want to go into all of them to say that there's a lot of potential for different ways to use focus ultrasound to help. But the ones we're really going to be talking about here are the, the highlighted ones in yellow, the thermal ablation one, 
or the vascular permeability for blood-brain barrier opening. This is a destruction, an example of just how you destroy tissue. On the left-hand side, this is thermal ablation, where you can use focus ultrasound to actually heat the tissue to 130 degrees Fahrenheit, and it gets 100% cell death very, very quickly. Also listed here is histotripsy, which is a mechanical disruption of the cells, and it can it doesn't heat the cells, but it, it creates a, a force of energy that disrupts the cell membranes, and you have this slurry of components left behind. One other thing about focus ultrasound is because you can deliver it to where you want it. And if you think about people who have had chemotherapy, chemotherapy can have a very good um, impact on the target, but generally it has impacts all around the body, most of which are undesired. The idea about focus ultrasound is we can target it to where we want it, in this case, in this patient's liver. And there are a number of drug delivery vehicles, and we won't spend too much time on them, but the, the point is you can attach different um, therapeutic entities to a number of these vehicles and then have them be activated by focus ultrasound. And one example of those are microbubbles. These are pretty small bubbles, um, less than the size of a red blood cell. And the idea is if you put those microbubbles in an IV bag of fluid and you give them to the patient, and then you target the area of the tumor with focused ultrasound, that causes the microbubbles to release their payload, impact the tumor. If those microbubbles can circulate around the rest of the, the body without any, any impact and just be excreted typically in the urine. For blood brain barrier opening, this is um, a, a very, very uh, interesting uh, uh, use of focused ultrasound. The blood brain barrier is a very tightly packed collection of cells that line the vasculature in the brain. And the idea is it's kind of a protective mechanism so that if you have the flu, you don't want to get the flu in your brain. And so these very tight cells prevent things in the bloodstream from getting through to the brain um, very easily. And so normally it's, it's a good thing. Um, but the, the problem is if you're giving a therapeutic entity that you want to get to the brain to help, um, it, 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 it can't get in there. And so there, and there's not a good way to temporarily open the blood brain barrier before focused ultrasound. There was some medications that can be used, but they are also pretty toxic and they're, they're global. You put them in the IV and they, they, they treat the whole part of the brain, et cetera. And there's, there, there, there are a lot of not good side effects that came from them. The, the, the use of focus ultrasound allows us to temporarily open the blood brain barrier just where we want to and, and not elsewhere. So in this, in this uh, uh, screen, the target is over here on the left and you can see afterwards, this is where we did the target and it's highlighted by the use of a contrast enhancement that it reveals itself on the, uh, on the imagery. Sorry for another busy slide, but I just want to give you an idea of the global landscape of what's out there for focused ultrasound. There's a lot of things that are out there. And on the, the, the left-hand part of the screen is kind of the green, the preclinical items, but it goes through and eventually gets to the, to the pink and purple where it's approved and reimbursed. And there's not only some listed here, but there's some on the second page. There's, so there's an awful lot of work looking to see how can we use focused ultrasound to enable treatment of a wide number of diseases. Another way to look at that is in, in 2006, there were three indications that were being pursued, and now there's over 170. This is a patient who's a left-handed architect who had essential tremor. And I, I, I know we're talking about Parkinson's disease, but this is an example I have of a patient who, who was treated, and the, the treatment target for tremor-dominant Parkinson's disease is exactly the same target as the treatment for essential tremor. So he, you can see he's having trouble with the tremor, moving the uh, jelly beans from one to the other. Here is his concentric circles and uh, straight lines. There is his target, and he's treated with focused ultrasound. And remember, this is done awake, no anesthesia, no incisions, no burr holes, et cetera. There is the target they got, and I hope you can see that there's a red arrow kind of pointing to it. Here is his concentric circles post-procedure, and here he is moving the jelly beans afterwards. 
Another example is patients who have uterine fibroids. And there's a patient with a, with a uterine fibroid. The option is to have surgery, or you can have focused ultrasound, which is what this patient selected. And she was treated, and you have to wait for the fibroids to be absorbed. I think this was eight or nine months later, and her fibroids are basically gone. Here's a, a, a view of patients for pancreatic cancer, and these are sliced images along the line of this yellow plane. And so here is kind of the tumor that we want. Here's how it was treated with focus ultrasound. This darkened color is the part that was treated. And over time, 22 months later, it has shrunken dramatically. Here's a patient with a desmoid in his hand. Again, desmoids are not malignant, but they can be really bad in terms of recurrence, and they can involve nerves and structures and be quite disfiguring. This patient was treated with focused ultrasound and had a really excellent result. Here's a patient with breast cancer. Again, there's the, the lesion identified. You can see how it was treated. This is a patient with a, a pelvic tumor. This is a six-year-old girl. And they tried doing this patient with surgery and actually um, they had to abandon the case because they didn't think she would survive because they ran into so much bleeding. They ended up trying to treat her with focused ultrasound. They, you can see the, the, the part of the tumor that was initially treated here, they did it in two stages. This allowed her to, to resume her, her uh, urinary function and things like that, which had been obstructed by the, the tumor before. And she's now eight and, and, and doing well. Now this tumor may continue to, to recur and may need to be treated again, but it, it's, it's bought her a, a significant amount of time without having major complications. And finally, here's an example of someone with prostate cancer. This is all prostatic cancer located here. It was treated with focused ultrasound. You see it shrunk down to a tiny portion of the size and the PSA is almost zero. So that's really just kind of an example of the potential of what's out there with focused ultrasound. And now I wanna say just a little bit about the foundation. Um, the, the, the key part for the foundation is that we need to move and we need to move quickly because saving time is saving lives. Delay really adds to unnecessary death, disability, and suffering. And there's, as, as you may know, there's a lot of impediments to getting something through the process from being a really cool device in somebody's laboratory to something that is actually out there available and reimbursed and treating patients um, in a wide scale. And uh, there, a number of the battles are listed here, but it's certainly, you know, uh, FDA approvals and turf battles and just the general resistance to change are big issues that we're facing. And the, 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 the challenge was that my boss, Dr. Neil Cassell, had been involved in taking something from a early uh, 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 tool and trying to get it uh, adopted before, something called the gamma knife. And he was incredibly frustrated because it took many, many years to get it through there. And, and he, he said, there's got to be a better example. And he went looking for a better example to try to have that same process not happen with focused ultrasound. And he couldn't find any. So he said he was obligated to invent something new. And that's when he started the Focus Ultrasound Foundation. And it really is, it's a tax exempt organization that really goes at medical research, education, and advocacy. And the, the, the goal is really to accelerate the development and adoption of focused ultrasound where appropriate to be the global standard of care. Now, these are some a little bit older slides, but we do a number of things to try to spread the information. We have a website, comes out every couple of weeks, and it might be a good idea for some of you to have some information on how to join that later, just to see what's happening, because there's a lot of things still happening in terms of Parkinson's disease. But we also have, um, um, uh, I'm saying for our newsletter, that, that, that comes out every couple of weeks. We have a lot of information on our website, and we've become more involved with social media. We had some pretty significant media placements, but it's uh, it, it's it's always never enough from from us because we want to get the word out to a lot of people. John Grisham is on our board, and he's very active on our board. And he wrote a, this book called The Tumor, which is a hypothetical example of what could happen with focused ultrasound treatment of someone with a brain tumor. We also believe that although we are working hard on this. We're not alone working hard on this. There are a number of other organizations that we want to partner with. And I put two of the ones that we partner with a lot on the top. Michael J. Fox Foundation, we've 
done research together with them in the past. We're doing research with them now and the American Parkinson's Disease Association. Our annual budget's about 15 million. It's all donation related. And over 60% of that goes to research. And if any of you wanted to contribute, this is the site on our website and you can direct them only to Parkinson's disease research if you would like. The goal of what we're trying to do is just to bust through these impediments to get things approved as quickly as we can. And the one thing that we look at that, that drives it home for us every day is this graph where the dark line going up is the normal pathway of how uh, medical devices get adopted. And if we can push the agenda by getting research accomplished quickly, move it along and move that line to the left, everybody in yellow are people that can be treated on, due to do our efforts that wouldn't have been treated otherwise. And that's what makes us try to remember if we can save time, we can save lives. So now let me get on to the um, the, the current research status. Um, and and um, there's a number of preclinical trials that are out there, but I'm really going to focus mostly on the clinical trials. So in terms of what's been approved by the FDA, tremor-dominant Parkinson's disease has been approved by the FDA. The, the target is the VIM, the ventral intermediate nucleus, which, as I said before, is the same target that we use for essential tremor. Here's the major reference that referred to that. And when they did this, they found they got a good improvement. 62% of people improved in their tremor scores. And at one year, they were, they, they were persistent. They did have some side effects. Some patients had some paresthesias or kind of numbness and tingling in their, in their face and their finger. And one patient had ataxia, which is a, a kind of a clumsy voluntary movement, typically with walking. In terms of Medicare reimbursement, Medicare uh, has covered it in, in the states listed here. And I'm sure some of you say, wait, Medicare is a national organization. Why are they only in some states? Well, Medicare is managed by a group of contractors called MACs. And different MACs handle three or four states or so. And so some MACs have approved this and other MACs have not. And uh, that, that's important because it takes time for the different MACs to go ahead and do their approving. And there's not really any good way to push them. They, they kind of do it on their own schedule. Um, this, this, this was approved, um, uh, in 2018. So here we are 2023 and we've got about half of the states that have, have approval. And you'll notice that California is not listed there. Um, one thing I will tell you is that, um, our understanding is that if you wanted to have treatment and you live in California, but you wanted to go to say Nebraska and have treatment there, because it is covered in Nebraska, our understanding is Medicare would pay for it in Nebraska. Now, obviously, we tell everybody, you want to confirm that with a treatment site to make sure you have that correct. But there is the opportunity, potentially, that if you want to be treated and you're willing to do a little traveling, you could um, do so and, and, and have Medicare pay for the treatment. So the other FDA approval is for Parkinson's disease dyskinesia. And dyskinesia is kind of a, a, a family of devices. It's, it's, it's strictly defined as it's just impairment of voluntary movement, but it also includes patients that have rigidity or bradykinesia. The target for this is the internal portion of the glob globus pallidus. And this was a, a large study in the New England Journal of Medicine, very reputable journal. It had 94 patients and almost 70% of them had a response at three months. And looking at the side effects, they really didn't have a lot of pallidotomy related side effects. Um, because again, this is a bigger study at 94 patients said one patient who had dysarthria or, or difficulty um, um, speaking, uh, another one had a visual disturbance and another patient had some facial weakness. Medicare insurance coverage is in process, which means there's not anything. And this was approved um, um, almost two years ago. In, in November, it'll be two years. Um, and so hopefully we will start to get the first sites maybe in, 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 a, in the third year, uh, hopefully by the fourth year, that'll start to pay for this. And once the first site does pay for it, typically some others tend to follow, but the getting the first one is, is always different, difficult, and it never happens as fast as we would like. 
In terms of international treatments, this has also been approved in, in for tremor dominant Parkinson's disease in, uh, across the, the pond and in Asia, and also uh, dyskinesia is, is approved elsewhere as well. Now, one of the things that you notice is that there are different spots that we treated for for the, the tremor versus the dyskinesia. And that that's true for where we are now, but there's a little bit more to that story. So I wanna do a little discussion of some anatomy for you, just to give you an idea of where the targets are. So the internal portion of the globus pallidus is right here in red, and the fibers kind of run down, go across, around, and come up, and another one's cut through, go across, and around, and up. So one target is the internal part of the globus pallidus, which we already talked about, but another target is the subthalamic nucleus, the STN, which is right here. And a third target is this white matter tract that's going here. It's called the pallidothalamic tract, or simply the PTT. And so there are kind of three targets underway right now that, that are being looked at for treatment of Parkinson's disease, dyskinesia, et cetera. So if you're looking at the subthalamic nucleus, this group in Spain that's done a lot of work on this, and th they did a study, 40 patients, again, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and they found that they were able to improve the target for Parkinson's disease by 50%, and it was preserved at 12 months, so a very impactful result. Here's how the study looked. They had patients blinded, so they didn't know if they are having the procedure or not, and then after some period of time, the patient's we're unblind and they say, okay, now I can go and have the, the, the procedure to go forward. But a very significant difference between the two in the terms of their results. They did have some side effects. Again, many were transient, but not all. And you see at 12 months, and remember, this is a 40 patient study. We had about 10 patients out of 40 that had some, some side effects. The palatothalamic tract, again, or the PTT is another target. And this is a group in Switzerland who have been really leaders in the development of focus ultrasound for treatment of these diseases. And they treated 51 patients. Now, they weren't all tremor-dominant Parkinson's disease. So you got to remember, it's not quite an apples-to-apples -apples comparison because some of these had uh, rigidity and others had kind of mixed symptoms. But in the 51 patients they treated, they found that about 54% had improvement from baseline. And it was preserved at 12 months. So again, a pretty significant result. Here's their results, and you can see this is their level beginning on and off meds, and, and then um, you can see the time goes, uh, they, they reduce going forward, and in this scale, lower is better. And they did have some side effects as well. Um, uh, many of them resolved over time, but not all. And, and typically, they found they had some speech difficulties or hypophonia with this trauma. So a couple of things to note. One is that the symptoms did not completely resolve. So when you use focus ultrasound, it's not like you have the procedure and it's all gone because they really are trying to dramatically improve your symptoms, but not have a lot of side effects to go with it. And the other question that comes up is kind of a theoretical one at this point, but is what happens with the ongoing progression of Parkinson's disease? Because Say I had tremor and I had focused ultrasound and my tremor went away completely. Over time, Parkinson's disease, as you know, continues to get worse. And so there is the theoretic possibility that at some point, the progression of the disease will now out, out, out overtake the, the treatment I had, my tremor may come back. Now we haven't seen that happen yet, but again, we haven't been doing this for 15 or 20 years. It's, it's been a shorter time period, but we've been watching for it, and we've not seen people say, hey, I had a successful treatment, but then it came back and I had to treat it again. Um, we know we can treat it again if it does come back, but it's just something to watch for because it can, can happen. Now, the other part of this is, as you know, a lot of people have bilateral disease, and up until this point, everything we've talked about has been really approved just for one side. Now, so there was some work done on bilateral treatment, and, and I'm, I'm talking a little bit at first about essential tremor here, but remember, the target is exactly the same for essential tremor as for tremor-dominant Parkinson's disease. So it, 
It, it, it is relevant. And there was a study done um, with 50 patients in multiple sites doing a staged bilateral treatment. And the idea between that is I could have a, a treatment of one side today, and then nine months later, they can come back and treat the other side. And this study has not yet been published yet. This, it's this one right here. Um, but the, um, the FDA has seen the data and has actually already gone ahead and improved the staged bilateral treatment for essential tremor in the US. Um, now, Medicare coverage of that is still uncertain. It's, it's believed that they're going to go ahead and cover it because each one is kind of an independent treatment. But we 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 don't want to we don't want to make statements about Medicare covering something definitely until we're certain about it, and uh, we're not quite certain yet. Um, but the key part is that you can now have both sides dumb for essential tremor. And we say, well, what about Parkinson's disease? Well, in Parkinson's disease, they did a a, uh, a study as well. Again, a significant size, 50 patients. This was mostly in the U.S., but Taiwan was there too. And they had a six-month interval between the treatments, and the target is the PTT. Um, and so they've completed the enrollment in this, but there's no publication yet. And I think where we are from our estimates, they have to you know do one side, wait the six months, then do the other side, then follow up on them, and then do the publication. And so we think the earliest we might see something is probably in early 2024, but we really don't have a good knowledge on that. But that is an interesting one that's, you know, close to, to seeing results on that and would be interesting. The other one is down here um, uh, in, in Spain. They did another uh, treatment for bilateral um, Parkinson's disease, and the target was the STN, subthalamic nucleus, and no publications on that yet. So bilateral treatment is in, in process. So in terms of questions for movement disorders, there are still a bunch, right? What, what about bilateral treatment? Do you use the same technique for both sides or should you use different ones? And, and what staging is needed, if at all? The staging is done because out of the abundance of caution, when we were treating these patients with open surgical procedures, they found that if they did them both at the same time, they had a much higher incidence of side effects, but that's with open surgery and that's not what we're doing. So they still wanted to do it separately just to be cautious, but maybe we don't need that at all. And what about using the different techniques for that? Um, and then what size lesion is optimal? And this is important too, because if you increase the size of, of the lesion you make, your efficacy improves, but also do the side effects. And similarly, if you decrease the size, you may risk your effectiveness, but you also get less side effects. So what's optimal? Still no um, um, definite decision on that. And the, the third part is also important because traditionally the way neurosurgeons would operate is they have an atlas of that's taken information from a, you know, a bunch and bunch of people to say what covers what and what part of your brain. And so that atlas that gives you some bony and landmarks that you can measure and target based on that. But there's also the way to use MRI using the tractography where you can kind of see where things are transmitting and, and processing in your brain that makes it personal to me to say, now we're not looking at the atlas, we're looking at my brain. But when you're doing that, you think, wow, that's gotta be better. Maybe, but when you're doing that, there's also some adjustments and 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 an error that comes in from doing that with MRI, and and it's it's unclear what is really the best right now. A lot of sites are using both techniques, and 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 going from that, but it, it's 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 still not clear what is the single best way of doing that. So we're going to switch gears a little bit because I was talking about all the, the movement disorders because that's what's FDA approved and what's out there and, and what, what a lot of the focus ultrasound treatment is, is, is aimed at currently. But as you all know, there are a lot of symptoms with Parkinson's disease that are not just movement disorders. And we'd like to see if we can use focus ultrasound to do a little bit more than just treat uh, your tremor. And so there were some studies done on patients with cognitive impairment. Let me give you a little background on this. When patients have um, Alzheimer's disease or other dementias, 
there was a, a group in Australia that tried opening the blood brain barrier, which we just talked about earlier, and in these animal models, and they found that when they did that, some of the amyloid and tau, which are kind of toxic substances that accrue in the brain with patients with these diseases, were less. They were able to escape better. And also, when they took those animals that had been treated and then retested them for their cognitive ability, they actually improved. And that, that was, you know, stunning news. And there are actually clinical trials going to treat patients with Alzheimer's disease right now based on those data. Um, they're still very early, but they're in process. And so th this group in Spain said, well, we know that there are people with Parkinson's disease that have cognitive impairment. Can we open the, the right areas? Um, and in that case, this is the putamen, uh, which is a central part of the brain uh, for, for Parkinson's disease and, and, and help with that. And the idea here is this is really just a small study looking at, can we do it? And, and, and. We, we want to make sure that we're not doing any harm when we open the blood-brain barrier in these patients. But they, and they found that they could. There really were no safety concerns. And they also did do a bunch of tests on the, the patients to see, well, what, what's, what's the impact we have on their cognitive impairment? And they actually found that, that there was some improvement. Now, we have to be very, very cautious on this because this was a very short follow-up and it was a small number of patients and it was uncontrolled. Um, and furthermore, there was a lot of variability in who improved and what. So one patient might have had a little better in the MOCA, but other ones did better on the NPI, and, and there, there was no consistency. But the key part was there were no safety concerns, and maybe we were able to help a little bit. And so they did a few patients, then they continued on with this, and that, that is something that, that is, um, is another piece of the puzzle as we're trying to use focus ultra saying, how can we further help patients with Parkinson's disease? Now, there were actually two releases at almost the same time that we're trying to look at how we can do more to help people with Parkinson's disease. And one is the group that I just mentioned in Spain, but another one was in Canada. And this group was looking at patients that have Parkinson's disease, but also have a reduction in glucose cerebrosidase. And glucose cerebrosidase is an enzyme that's involved in the metabolic pathway. And and, and they have a, a lack of production of that enzyme that creates problems. And so they said, hmm, the, the typical way of treating these patients is that you give glucose cerebrosidase in the IV and let it um, try to get into the brain to help. And, and some gets there, but not very much. And so the idea was, what if we opened the blood-brain barrier and then gave glucose cerebrosidase and see if it happened? And so we actually funded this study and they, they did it here and it actually worked. They were able to get it in. So what the, they're, this was a very small study, there were only four patients. And so now they're doing Cerozyme 2, and Cerozyme is the, the trade name for this, this uh, uh, glucose cerebrosidase imitator. And, and they're trying to do dose escalation and also do some radio labeling of it to ensure that it gets there and has the, the, the dramatic effect that they're seeing. And so the importance of this is for both of these studies, these and the ones in, in, in um, Spain, is we're saying, can we use focus ultrasound to try to have a greater impact on, on the brain where the, the, where, is, where the fundamental cause of Parkinson's disease is happening? And both studies said, yeah, it seems like you can. So the overall goal is really to, to what can we do to see if we can truly stop Parkinson's disease? And this is one study that's a preclinical study. So again, this is the only one that's preclinical. And this is the group in Spain. And, and what they really were looking at is say, okay, if we can, if we can open the blood-brain barrier, what can we do to see if we can stop or reverse Parkinson's disease? And they did this in a, in a um, non-human primate model. And, and they were giving a genetic vector to, to deliver and hopefully um, uh, you know, resolve the problems with increased dopamine. Um, and this study has been published 
Um, and it was it was successful in one way and not another way. The successful part is they were able to open the, the brain. They were able to deliver the medicine and, and it did get there. Um, they, they had trouble with the, 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 uh, uh, the genetic vector delivery. And, and, and so they're still saying, hmm, we know we can do it, but now what is the best device? And that's what they're working on literally right now. Is saying, okay, we can get there. We believe we can get there. And we've shown it in all these different models. Now, what is it that we need to put in there that's going to see if we can solve the problem? So as exciting as that is, we still have to say, wait, what about trying to go at the underlying cause of Parkinson's disease? And there are multiple questions here, just a couple of them. But the, the first one is, what agent or agents? And then also, what dose? How long will it last? What about combinations? And furthermore, is what location? Okay, we think that the, the, we we can go at the putamen and, and go out there, but is is that the best? We we have, really don't know. And what about the timing? How long does it last? How many times would it need to be repeated, et cetera? All these things are still items that will need to be worked out. So, what are you? What if you're interested in focus ultrasound treatment? What 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 should you do? And before I even start this, I'm going to say that, that, you know, even though I'm a medical doctor, we and the Focus Ultrasound Foundation are not giving medical advice. We're trying to help direct you to places to see about treatment, because as you probably know, if you if you called up your local medical center and say, hey, I want to touch something about Focus Ultrasound, they may or may not get you to the right person. So it, it's important to try to help direct you to say who is doing it and here's how you can contact them. And one thing I would say is, Remember that there's no issue in learning about what is available, even if you decide it's not for you. One thing I should say is that, you know, our foundation is trying to push the research to move focus ultrasound to be available. But that's not like we're saying that focus ultrasound is good and DBS or deep brain stimulation is bad. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying that deep brain stimulation is available and it's out there and you should look at it. But I think if you have some of these symptoms that are approved for treatment, you also ought to look at focus ultrasound so you can have the apples to apples comparison to see what's right for you. Um, so if your movement disorder is predominantly tremor, then you should get evaluated by an FUSMD uh, and, and to see what they can offer you and to see what the side effects are and say, okay, what do they think they can do to help you? And I've listed, here's the, the, um, the treatment centers. And I listed the Insight Tech treatment centers because there are new centers opening up all the time. And so that gives you the latest group. And again, here's the list of the places where it is covered by Medicare. But what if you have dyskinesia, bradykinesia, or rigidity, or combinations? Well, the, 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 if you have the ability to be a cash payer, you can contact a site and go pay cash. And we don't have the, the prices for all these things, but a ballpark estimate, a very rough ballpark estimate, is around forty thousand dollars. So it's not like it's a it's an insignificant amount, but it's possible if you were going to do that, you could you could do that. Um, and and if you're going to do that, the, the place that I would recommend locally is probably Stanford. And the reason I say that is because UCSF is also a great site, and they're doing a lot of great things, but. I don't believe they were around when we were doing the studies on the PTT or even on the GPI, the, the, the globus pallidus. And so they don't have quite the experience in treating those as saying, for your symptoms, I think you should have the PTT. And they would recommend maybe you should wait until the PTT is approved because I think it can help with your tremor and these other symptoms that you have as well. I don't think they, 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 they have that experience that they do, I believe, in Stanford. Again, and I'm, we're, we're not affiliated with any of these sites. There's no, um, there's no incentive for me to say one greater than the other. I'm just talking about their experience with it. Um, if you don't have the ability to cash pay, then you probably want to subscribe to our newsletter and wait for Medicare payment to begin to happen. We will put something in when it, be, when it starts to happen. We don't update it every time another state comes up, but when the first site does, we, we typically do. The other thing I would suggest is there's a lot still happening in this area. So uh, I, I would suggest that you sign up for our newsletter. It's totally free, it comes to you by email. And you know you can screen through and see if there's anything that's attentive to, to, to you or not. And again, 
This can be found if you go to the Focus Ultrasound Foundation website, scroll to the very bottom, there's a thing that says sign up for the newsletter, or if you have this link, you can click to it. One final thing is um, John Dutton is a patient who had tremor for Parkinson's disease, and he wanted to make a movie about focus ultrasound treatment and how it was done. And it's it's very nicely done. He obviously decided to do this before he knew whether it worked or not. Um, but he says it really changed his life and he really thinks it's worth the time to watch it. So this is the link to get to it on YouTube. Um, and again, this is all going to be shared afterwards, but um, it, it's, it's worth the time to really see exactly how it's done. So at this point, um, we can open it up for questions. I'm going to click on to this next slide here, which has some particular things that, that might be helpful to you. If, if any of you wants to reach out to me directly, you know, here's my email address. Just go ahead and send me a note and we can communicate about things. Um, also, if you want to sign up for our newsletter, here is the information to sign up for that. And then um, if you're looking for the treatment site locations, this is the link to that as well. And I'll leave this up for just a second. So if anybody wants to copy it, they can. We'll leave this up for, like we say, uh, maybe 30 seconds or so, and then we'll switch to a grid view. At this point, Anyone who has questions, what you have to do is simply unmute yourself and ask. Because that's what the Q&A session is about. And I hope I didn't put everybody to sleep, but I had a lot of information I wanted to cover. So, um... Okay, I'm going to re remove the spotlight so we can see who's here. All right, and I'll stop sharing then, right, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, stop sharing. Okay. Okay, very good. All right, so whoever, uh, Gil, I see that uh, you've unmuted. Do you have a question? Noel, no more. Just first uh, say thanks, Tim, for all the very valuable information. Um, I just noticed I have this Stanford shirt on that was not intentional. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I think one one of the things that I'm most interested in at this point is to make sure that our people uh, in our little corner of the world have access at the end to the very best possible people and therapies that you know they that we we can benefit from having <clears throat> two two great centers like Stanford and UCS of close. Um, and that the fact that, you know, you've provided such specific information, both in terms of what's available now, but what's coming, I think will be extremely valuable as this becomes, becomes much more uh, a, a part of our lives. Well, I'm happy. I'm happy to share it with you. And I think you're absolutely right. Um, uh, you know, Stanford has been a lot involved in a lot of the, the research efforts because that's, you know, part of their mission. But UCSF has come on in, in a very significant way with some very leading people, and um, I, I think uh, they're 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 going to be another powerhouse for for you guys for your care, which is wonderful. Do you know much about Kaiser Permanente? Not I, I know much. they offer DBS. I think they may offer focused ultrasound, but I'm not sure. I, I'm I'm not sure if they offer focused ultrasound for Parkinson's disease. I believe they offer it for um, uh, focused ultrasound for essential tremor, but um, I, I, I'm I don't know about it for Parkinson's disease. There are so many insurance companies that that we really we just focus mainly on Medicare because there are too many policies and they change those policies all the time. So it's just too hard to to, to keep up with them. One of the questions that came to my mind, and I've been asked this many times, is why would one choose deep brain stimulation versus uh, focused ultrasound or vice versa? 
So perhaps you could take a few minutes and do a comparison. Sure. And and again, um, um, I, th I think the best comparison really starts with what are your specific symptoms and and have the physician that treats these patients and also sees them afterwards and says, okay, what can I do to help your specific symptoms, but also what can I not help and what um, what what side effects and risks are associated with it? That's that's the that's the first place to start. But I, I really look at the, the the question about DBS and and uh, and focus ultrasound as as a couple of kind of different options, and some of it comes down to what is my personal um, desire as a patient. Some patients say, "Look, I want to do the most conservative." reversible situation as I can. So if it doesn't work, I want to be able to undo it. And, and in honesty, that really favors deep brain stimulation because yes, it's invasive when they put it in, but if you don't like it and it's, and it's, it's not helpful and it's not good, they can remove the, the transducers, remove the battery packs, pull it away and, and, and it's all gone. Right. Whereas if you have focused ultrasound, the folks that want to go with focused ultrasound say, I don't want to mess with it. I want to just fix it and go on with my life. Um, because with deep brain stimulation, there is some you know, adjustment of the transmitters, et cetera, and they have to replace the battery packs and sometimes the transducer breaks. So there are some items where it's kind of ongoing. Whereas with focused ultrasound, they basically, they go in there, they do the thermal ablation and you're done. And if it's really good, you're really, really happy. If it's not really good, they can't reverse it. They can't undo it. You got to try to deal with what you have and go forward. So the, that the mindset of the patient saying, hey, do I want to mess with this or do I want to have it be done is, is really important. And one thing I will also say is that if you are going to have focused ultrasound, um, a lot of patients don't like the fact that it's done in the MRI scanner. And some patients will say, give me some medicine to make me be kind of sleepy and not too aware when this is going to happen. And I would really strongly encourage you not to do that with focus ultrasound, because when you're in the scanner, they do some test sonications just, and they're going to ask, you know, do you have any tingling around your lips or any tingling in your hands or, or how's your vision? Good? And all those things will ask you. And if you're, semi sedated and not really aware you may not be as attuned to those symptoms and you may have more side effects and um, so and most sites won't give you too much anyway but i would just encourage you to say i'm going to go in there and i'm going to be as tough as i can and i'm just going to deal with the noise and the com confined space but i want to be attentive when they ask me if i'm having problems from this or that because i want to give them the best possible answer so that we can get the best result how long are you in the MRI tube? It really varies. It's typically about two and a half hours. Some sites are getting faster than that, but that's a ballpark. Uh, and you're not there consistently the whole time. They, you, they put you in, they do some tests, and then they'll come out. And a lot of times they'll have you do the concentric circles and lines, and they'll have you say some things to make sure that your speech is okay and all that. So they, they slide you in and slide you out, but you know, so you're not in the confined space the whole time, but you, you still have the frame on that holds your head and you, you're, you're still laying still to do all these things. Jim, uh, are you working with any other MRI manufacturers other than Insight Tech? Yeah, we are. Um, th there's uh, a, a group um, uh, from Taiwan called Navifus. That is has a device that um, is not um, approved in the U.S. really for anything right now, but um, we're, we're working on that to to try to um, you know help them with some of their their research studies and and a, a, one of the things about this device is it's it's um, it's done by kind of a computer modulation of targeting. So rather than so it's not done in the MRI scanner. You have an MRI first and they they import the MRI to their computers and then they target based on the MRI um, to treat your, your, your brain um, with, with their device. So it's it, it's uh, it's early um, in, in that one. And um, 
it's it, I don't even think there's I don't think there's any movement disorder in the U.S. with that going on now. But they're they're the furthest along for this, as you can imagine. The development of the of the uh, the brain scanner is is one of the most challenging parts because you got to have all these pieces coming together. You mentioned uh, the blood-brain barrier and research being done and clinical studies being done around opening up that blood-brain barrier. And uh, can you just comment a little bit more about that in relationship to Parkinson's? Well, it's 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 interesting because I, I the, a lot of the work that has been done for this is done by uh, Dr. Obeso's group in Spain and. He is, um, uh, uh, his mission in life is to see if he can treat and, 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 and come up with a solution to Parkinson's disease. And his effort has really been to try to um, see where he can open and, and, and insert the appropriate therapeutic entity, which is still to be determined. Um, but when you ask him, and I talked to him about that, that study I listed where the, the two studies for the cognitive impairment patients, and I said, so, you know, run me forward a little bit. How are you going to try to use this to try to help patients that are uh, facing cognitive impairment? And he said, you know, I'm really not trying to use focus ultrasound to treat the, the patients that have uh, significant cognitive impairment. I really want to use this information to treat Parkinson's in general to stop it. That's what I'm trying to do. So, because I think a, a lot of people would say that if, if you wait to the point where you, you're having um, significant cognitive impairment, whether it's in uh, Alzheimer's disease or in Parkinson's disease, you're so far down the line that it's really hard to, to bring things back and reverse it. We really got to say, if we have these early problems that we can recognize and we treat it then with, again, the appropriate uh, therapeutic agent, which we don't know what that is yet, then we can reverse Parkinson's disease and stop it early. I think that's what he's, what he's going for. You had mentioned in your presentation the use of, I think you call them micro bubbles, you know, in which would be activated by the focused ultrasound. And it seems to me that that kind of approach, when coupled with perhaps, is there a way in which you can not so much reverse the Parkinson's, but, you know, you have the death of cells in the brain. Uh, that are producing the dopamine. Is there any way in which that could be reversed through something of uh, a STEM model? You know, create. I, <laughs> I'm just really fascinated by the whole subject. Well, the, you know, it's you're you're wise to be because it's. I think it's 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 really opens the opportunity to to try to come at it from a number of different perspectives. I mean, the, again, it's 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 really important to understand that bef before focus ultrasound, there wasn't a good way to temporarily open the blood brain barrier. It, it was it 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 was the the ways that they did it were with drugs, and the drugs did the entire brain, and there's all kinds of swelling and shifts of fluid and all kinds of bad things that happened with it, and so it just wasn't done. But now that we know that we can do it, and the reason I put those studies up is, is that it's it's really important because there's the accumulation of evidence from all of those studies that, that are, and, and quite frankly, from the studies in Alzheimer's disease saying, look, we can open the blood-brain barrier and it will close back and, and, and on its own, and there's really no problem with that. And I think what we're going to see is we're going to see people trying all sorts of of you know genetic things like we already looked at, but also you know uh, areas of of, of uh, enzymes and other things to try to promote the the production of of dopamine in these cells and and in in a wide variety of way. And a lot of those things are probably having 
having to be done preclinically before they become um, in, in the clinical realm. But once they do, and we figure out what's the right one to do, it'll be very easy to translate that to to a um, to a clinical trial for for humans. So it's it's in in some ways it's exciting because we feel like okay we can do this now, but but we're still not quite there yet because we aren't sure what what the drug is. And and there's a, a whole handful of things that are being discussed. And I I can tell you from conversations I've had with Dr. Obeso and others that they are they're really trying to say okay. Where's the next best bet? Where do we go? What do we do? And and we've told them, when you decide, you know where to find us because we want to fund it because we want to get this done. Um, so you can remember our whole thing is speed. So we're trying to push it along as fast as we can. Periodically, we have people who are interested in participating in clinical trials. They like to try things at the farthest advances of technology. They're brave souls. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, well and what do they do? The, the the best thing for them to do is, you know, there's we do our best to keep updated the listing of, of clinical trials on our website. So if you go under Parkinson's, there's some trials that are listed there. Um, and, it, you know, the, the the challenge with some of these trials is they they may not be in your location. You know, there may be a trial in sure. Spain or someplace like that. But, you know, the other option they can do is they can reach out to me. A, a lot of people are good, and and on and especially some of the younger folks that looking on the internet. And if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, um, that is the government website for all the clinical trials that are out there. And so if in, in the top part, if you put in, you know, Parkinson's disease, and in the second listing there, they have other items and you put focused ultrasound, it will bring up the clinical trials that are that are out there that are listed. So um, and uh, I, if you want, I'll send you the 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 the, the link for that um, Absolutely. Uh, for clinicaltrials.gov and then you can share it with your your folks. But the, the other option is they can call me and I will tell them. I mean, I, um, it, we're a small organization. So if if, 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 if we get a ton of people inquire me uh, you got to give me a little time but but we respond to everybody because it's all important and and i'll tell you what's out there and 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 I'm happy to do it well this has been a tremendous presentation very powerful i'm sure that we will get many 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 more people who watch us over the coming months so at this point i want to thank you very much are there any last questions or comments Well, thank you all for staying here and I appreciate the opportunity and you all have a great rest of the day.